Hi guys, this is a short, short video on genetics and genetics cases. Now I remember preparing for this exam and genetics scared me. It scares a lot of people and people get very confused about what to do in genetics cases. I've had a lot of people at our courses ask for a genetics video. I've had a lot of people email in asking for a genetics video. So it's clearly something that people get bugged about. But hopefully this short, short video helps to demystify it a little bit, make it clearer as to what you're supposed to be doing within a genetics case, and hopefully make you feel a little bit more confident when it comes up both in your practice and on the real day itself. Now, I'm Amin I'm a GP and a TPD based in Birmingham, and hopefully you'll find this video useful, informative, and easy to follow. So let's get started. So the first key tip when it comes to a genetics case don't do things for the sake of doing so. Don't have your stereotypical things that you have in mind that you think you should do in a genetics case and just pull them out as autopilot in every single one that you come across. Things like family trees, things like drawing those little genetic diagrams to show people how much percentage risk they have for a particular condition. Of course they're useful and of course they have their place in certain cases. But remember, don't do it just for the sake of it. Find out what a patient wants to know. Do they want to have a detailed explanation about why they fit into this particular part of a diagram? Do they want to understand in great detail what genes are and how the different combinations line up to produce a percentage? Sometimes they don't, and you can waste a lot of dead time in genetics cases just doing things for the sake of them. So it's really important to understand a little bit about what the case is about actually figure out what does this patient want to know. Do they just want to know the basics or do they actually want to know in greater detail? But don't go onto autopilot and start drawing things just for the sake of them thinking that you're going to rack up marks. It doesn't always work like that and you may be covering a lot of dead time when actually you could be spending that time on something a lot more focused. Secondly, Find out whereabouts on the genetics journey this patient is. Now, what do I mean by that? Genetics cases can cover a whole spectrum of patients as they progress through their genetic condition. So it could be people right at the beginning. They have no family links of any condition, but they just heard about a condition. They want to come to you to get a bit more information. Secondly, a family member might have been diagnosed with a certain condition. They're coming to you to find out what their risks are and what it means for their family member. Thirdly, someone could have been referred for genetic testing. The case could well be about the pros, the cons, the implications of testing and discussing that in greater detail. Finally, it could be someone who has been diagnosed with a genetic condition and they're coming to you either for support to get them through it, information about it, or maybe questions about the future. Am I going to pass it on to my own children, for example? So remember, you can't cover everything in a genetics case. You need to work out whereabouts on the line they are, what information has been gathered, what do you know, what are their queries, and spend your management not dealing with everything about that particular condition so you can try and show off that you know so much about it. It's about what are the two or three things that are really key for this patient in their journey, and it's about tailoring your management to hit those targets. So find out where they are, find out how long along this journey they are, and make sure your case and your management plan is tailored to that. So the third key tip is when it comes to giving numbers in genetics cases. Now, of course, people come to us asking, what's my chance of getting this? What's the chance of my child developing this condition given that I've got a carry, carrier status or something like that? Now, usually we're trigger happy at giving numbers. We figure out that something's autosomal dominant. So straight away, we tell the patient, you've got a 50% chance of getting this condition. But remember, it's always important to find out what do we know already. So, for example, your father might have an autosomal dominant condition and we tell them they've got a 50% chance, but actually, have we found out whether the mother's been tested yet? What if the mother also has that condition, it just hasn't materialised yet, for example, Huntington's, and you tell this patient they've got a 50% chance of getting it, when actually, if mother's also got that Huntington's gene, they've got a 75% chance of getting this condition. So the first thing about giving numbers and percentages is to find out what do we already know. If they tell you, for example, that their second parent hasn't been tested yet, then you can only say that you assume, that I assume that if your mother, for example, has not got this condition, then you have a 50% chance of getting this yourself. But you must put that line in if you don't know whether the other person has been tested as yet. 
And the second thing when it comes to dealing with numbers is make sure you're really clear and simple about what those numbers represent. So for example, a lot of people will say in an autosomal dominant condition that you've got a 50% chance of getting this. Now it's really important to make sure that the patient understands that it's not 50% of children will get this. So for example, if I'm one of four brothers, two of us will have this condition, two won't. It's about being specific and saying that in every case, in every single case, there's a 50% chance that you may develop this condition. I.e., if you are four brothers, it might be that all four get the condition, it might be that all four don't have the condition, it may be two and two, it might be one and three. But the, the point to specify is that every single child has a 50% chance, it's not 50% of children, which is what sometimes it comes across when people are doing these cases. So when it comes to the numbers, make sure you keep it specific, make sure you get it right, but find out what information do I know beforehand so that the numbers that I give are relevant and correct. Fourth tip, keep it simple. So many times when I practice genetic cases with people, the explanation of the genetics case is about two and a half minutes long, and I'm still just as confused as to what this actually means for me as a patient. Keep things simple. One or two line explanations for things like genes, how things are transferred, what dominant means, what recessive means. Don't go on for two or three minutes. Remember the technique, chuck and check. Every time you say a couple of lines, check with the patient. How does that sound? A couple more lines. Is this making sense, Mrs. Smith? Don't keep rambling on for two or three minutes trying to get your knowledge out about a particular condition and just make the patient more worried and more confused and actually make yourself more confused sometimes as well. So keep it simple, two or three lines and stop. The patient may say, that's great doctor, I don't really need to know about that, but what about this or what am I going to do about it? But if we're talking for three minutes non-stop trying to show off that we understand this condition in great detail, again, it's like we said in point number one, dead time, you don't get any, any extra marks, and you end up leaving the patient more confused. So keep it simple, couple of lines, short and sharp. And the final tip that I mentioned to you guys when it comes to genetic cases, because it's something that we see a lot when we practice these cases in our courses, don't forget the basics. Yes, you've got a genetic condition here, but you've also got a patient here. You've still got other parts of their lives and other things that you need to be asking about and also bringing back in the second half. So these worries and fears, for example, are they affecting their relationship? Are they affecting their job? Are they turning to things like smoking alcohol to deal with the stress of all of this genetic condition worries that they have? What about things like their fears? Is it that they just have the condition or actually are they fearing other things like am I going to pass it on to my children one day for example? But you've got to find out your basics just like in a hypertension case, just like in a COPD case, you don't just not ask about the medicine there but in genetics cases we often just focus on that and nothing else. So your psychosocial stuff, your ice, your red flags, they're all just as important in a genetics case than they are in other cases as well. And remember, this needs to be represented in your second half. We've talked a lot on our management video about dealing with a few issues going on within a particular scenario. Again, don't make your sole issue the medicine or the genetics. Don't spend the first four minutes of management talking about the, the way this condition works in terms of its genetic format, but forget to come on to the stress that this patient is being caused due to this worry, or forget to come on the fact that it's causing problems in their relationship because of all these the kind of links between the family connections. Don't forget those things. They're just as important as showing off your genetic knowledge. So remember, don't forget the basics. Make sure you're demonstrating a rounded approach to this patient and not zeroing in just on the genetics. So guys, I hope that's been of use to you. Hopefully it's helped to demonstrate that genetics cases don't have to be this difficult, technically expertise type of case that we need to be demonstrating each and every time. They can be simple, they can be basic, and you can make them a lot easier than people often fear. Now, if you have any other requests for any other types of videos that you want producing, both for GP training as well as for the two exams in particular, then drop me an email, drop me a tweet, contact the website. You can see all the details down below. But I hope it's been useful. And if you guys are taking the CSA exam in the near future, then good luck. I'm sure you'll be great. And I hope to see you again soon.